I'm now very pleased to introduce Judge Barbara Lagoa, who will moderate our showcase panel on private control over public discussion. She is and has been since late 2019 a judge on the 11th Circuit Court of Appeals. Before that, she served with distinction on the Florida Supreme Court, having spent several years on Florida's other lesser courts. She brings a unique perspective of a state trial court judge, a state appellate court judge, a state Supreme Court justice, and now a federal appellate court judge. Judge Lagoa, the floor is yours. Thank you so much, Dean. Thank you for the introduction. It is truly a pleasure to be here today in person, not wearing a mask, to moderate this panel where we're gonna be discussing private control over public discourse with a distinguished panel of experts. The Supreme Court has called the internet the modern public square, and that's certainly true. But unlike public squares in the country's past, this modern public square in the form of digital platforms, whether social media platforms like Twitter or Facebook, or search engines like Google, provide avenues for and access to historically unprecedented amounts of speech and information. And unlike public squares in this country's past, access to this modern public square is concentrated in the hands of few parties. For example, while Google controls 90% of the market share for search engines, it can suppress content by downlisting a search result or by steering users away from certain content by manually altering autocomplete results. And Facebook and Twitter can also narrow a user's access to information and content through similar means. <coughs> Indeed, Twitter, under the terms of its own service agreement, can remove any person from its platform, including the President of the United States, at any time, for any or for no reason, while allowing other public actors, such as Nicolás Maduro, Daniel Ortega, or Miguel Díaz-Canel, unlimited access. Is that an exercise of individual liberty by the digital platform, which is a private party? Or do these digital platforms wield an enormous amount of power that needs to be regulated? And if they do require regulation, what kind of regulation? And what existing legal doctrines should be applied to these privately owned digital platforms that constitute the modern public square? You'll hear from some of our panelists today that the answer might lie with common law doctrines like common carrier or public accommodation, doctrines that permit regulation that limit the private platform's right to exclude. I'm looking forward to a robust debate from these speakers on these issues. Each speaker will have 10 minutes for an opening remark, and I'm gonna hold you to it. And then we're gonna follow it with uh, a moderated discussion, and then I promise that we will open up the floor for 15 or 20 minutes for questions from the audience. Um, before we hear from the speakers, let me introduce them. I know that they don't need any introduction, but I'm gonna introduce them in the order that they will be speaking. I'm gonna start first with Professor Eugene Volokh. He is the Gary T. Schwartz Distinguished Professor of Law at UCLA School of Law. He is an expert in First Amendment law. He is the founder and co-author of the Volokh Conspiracy. I'm sure many of you read that, a libertarian and conservative blog. He is widely published and he recently published an article titled, Treating Social Media Platforms Like Common Carriers which is relevant to our discussion today and which I highly recommend. Our next speaker will be Professor Randy Barnett. He is the Patrick Hotung Professor of Constitutional Law at Georgetown University Law Center. Notably among his many accomplishments, he is also the director of the Georgetown Center for Constitution. He has published 12 books, countless journal articles, and has a forthcoming uh, he has a book that he co-authored with Evan Burnick titled The Original Meaning of the Fourth Amendment, Its Letter and Spirit. And I believe he has a book signing afterwards. The next presenter we have is Professor Adam Kandub. He is the Professor of Law and Director of the Intellectual Property Information and Communications Law Program at Michigan State University. 
Prior to this position, he served as Deputy Assistant Secretary of Commerce for Telecommunications and Information at the Commerce Department, as well as Deputy Associate Attorney General at the Department of Justice during the Trump administration. He is uh, also the writer of an article published last year in the Yale Journal of Law and Technology, which is entitled Bargaining for Free Speech, Common Carriage, Network Neutrality, and Section 230, which is uh, a seminal piece of authorship that he wrote, and I highly recommend reading that as well. And our last speaker today is Professor Jane Bambauer. She is a professor of law at the University of Arizona College of Law. She specializes in the emerging and highly important area of technology law. She's written numerous journal articles, has testified before Congress, and her research assesses the social costs and benefits of big data and questions the wisdoms of many well-intentioned privacy laws. Her articles have appeared in the Stanford Law Review, the Michigan Law Review, the California Law Review, and the Journal of Empirical Legal Studies. Please, uh, let's welcome the, spe the speakers and give them a round of applause. So without further ado, Eugene. All right. 10 minutes. You got it. Uh, is there going to be a red light? Oh, yes. Okay, <laughs> um, so uh, I think I need to be speaking here because I've got the PowerPoints. Um, 10 to 12, 10 to 10 12. 10 to 12, you got it. <coughs> uh, so uh, it's a, a great pleasure to be at this conference as always and talking about the subject. Um, I wanna stress there's a question mark at the end of my title. And it's an important piece of punctuation here, I think, because I don't know what the right answer is here. I think it's an important uh, question. I spent 80 plus pages talking about it. I'm still not sure what the right answer is, but I wanna kind of air one possible approach to these social media debates, uh, just, just to see whether it might make sense. Uh, this is one of those areas where, uh, where I think there's been a lot of uh, assumption that of course the platforms have the right, uh, not just a right under current law, but the constitutional right to choose what to include and what to exclude. I think that assumption is in some measure right, in some measure perhaps not. Uh, and I'd love to see what, what people say about it, both my colleagues in the academy, people in this room, lawyers, legislators, and such. So I wanna start, I wanna start with uh, Justice Stevens' Citizens United dissent. Uh, now, uh, I'm with the majority on Citizens United. I imagine most people in the audience are. I, my sense is most people in, in the academy and uh, legal academy and newspaper commenters and such are with the dissent. Uh, but I think what everyone might say about the majority of the dissent in Citizens United is I think they both had very good points. They both made some very good arguments. The question is how those arguments fit within the doctrine and how you weigh the value of each. So I thought that Justice Stevens' dissenting argument is worth uh, bringing up a bit because what it was all about is the concern with economic power being translated into political power. Now, in any free market economy, some element of that is going to be present. And I don't think Justice Stevens was sort of radically opposed to that, nor do I think the campaign reformers are categorically uh, opposed to it. Uh, nonetheless, there is, I think, real reason to worry in a democracy, even if you are a free market uh, uh, sympathizer li li like I am. And, um, uh, reason to worry about entities that are powerful, immensely economically powerful, to the level that their, that their yearly revenue exceeds the GNP of many nations, uh, that that power may be unduly leveraged into political influence. And that's what, he, what Justice Stevens was talking about. A legislature might conclude that unregulated spending by corporations about candidates will give them unfair influence and distort public debate. The opinions of real people may be marginalized. And if we want to have competition among actors in the political arena be truly competition among ideas, there needs to be some regulation to prevent that marginalization. Uh, cor corporate domination of electioneering can also generate the impression that corporations dominate our democracy. And politicians who fear a corporation's, uh, uh, corporation's power here may be cowed into silence about that corporation or perhaps about, the, about those things the corporation just doesn't want them to talk about. Now again, I, I think the majority got this right. 
because I think none of this justifies restricting the speech of corporations. Among other things also, it turns out that the speech of corporations is actually a very small portion, uh, even post-Citizens United, uh, of um, uh, d discourse about, uh, about candidates, maybe five, 10 percent, we don't know for sure. Uh, so I don't think that, I think that Justice Stevens' argument rightly didn't carry the day there. Uh, but he was talking about this is an argument for restricting corporation speech. But I think it applies even more to, to questions about regulating corporate restrictions on individual speech. The one on one side is this concern about excessive economic power, and on the other side are the free speech rights of corporations and of the people who own and run those corporations. Uh, I do think the free speech rights prevail. But when on one side is this interest in or this concern about, uh, about uh, excess economic or use of economic power to influence politics. And the other side is the corporation's ability to restrict speech, not to engage in their own speech, but to restrict speech. The, the balance, it seems to me, may well be different. So here's one way of thinking about it. Let's think of platforms as places where people can speak using others' property. So let's imagine a spectrum. On one end of the spectrum may be newspapers and magazines. Newspapers and magazines often carry the speech of outsiders, letters to the editor, ads, uh, op-eds, uh, op uh, syndicated columns, and such. Uh, and they have not just the right to include materials, they have the right to exclude materials. That's been recognized, as we'll see shortly, under the First Amendment, that that's part of their editorial discretion, and I think quite rightly so, in part because newspapers and magazines solve the problem of information overload. Uh, the newspaper and magazine is valuable at least as much as for what it excludes as for what it includes, right? There are all of these stories out there and all of these topics, important and not, the stories may be well written or not. The stories may be accurate or not. They may be intelligent or not. And we rely on newspapers and magazines to filter that for us. And I think it would be a real mistake to try to regulate newspapers and magazines for fairness or, uh, or even handedness. Um, bookstores are another uh, item that historically has been seen on that side of the spectrum. They don't actually create new works, they don't edit particular works, but they do select works, which is why there are such things as free market bookstores, or feminist bookstores, or Christian bookstores, which, which is also, I think, pretty useful as a means of dealing with information overload, that if you have a bookstore you trust, you might go there and expect that the books that they'll display for you, for you to browse will be interesting books, well-written books, books worth reading. And I think actually, and actually I wrote a white paper on this uh, uh, wearing my lawyer hat for Google, uh, but I, I would also endorse this as, a, as an academic. Google as provider of search also serves that function. Whatever you may want search to be, you don't want it to be content neutral. Imagine a content neutral search engine. I don't think you even want it viewpoint neutral. If you ask it how old the earth is, let's say, you probably want the viewpoint that is sort of shared by the scientific community rather than whatever somebody, uh, uh, somebody may have search engine optimized to try to put up top. Um, likewise, I think with regard to platforms recommending pages you might like. That is actually very close, I think, to what newspapers or bookstores in particular do. An interesting question is where you put Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter managing conversations. So comments, say, by somebody on my page uh, on, or on my tweet. But then when you get down to the bottom of that, you see situations where we don't expect entities to, to select and edit. In fact, we forbid them from doing that. Postal service is an example. Postal service, at least since the 1940s, it's been understood, isn't supposed to say, oh, this is good speech, this is bad speech. Uh, perhaps setting aside a few, some examples of actually outright unprotected speech. Now, the post office is a government-run entity, but we take the same view with regard to a phone company. Imagine a phone company says, we happen to know, not from listening in, but from public information, that this phone number is being used as a recruiting number by the Klan or by Antifa, or by the communists, or by whoever else. And we are just appalled, and our users are, are, are other subscribers are appalled uh, by, uh, by our property being used for these conversations. So we're just gonna cancel their phone number. Um, that's, uh, that's not something they can do. They are common carriers. They're, they're not supposed to leverage their power, whether it's 
monopoly or monopoly-ish power as with landlines or non-monopoly power as with the famously competitive cell phone companies. They're not supposed to leverage that economic power into political power, power over the discourse. Likewise, UPS and FedEx, if they say we don't want to deliver from your bookstore, that's not something they're entitled to do. So one question is where, what should we assimilate Facebook, YouTube, and Twitter as providers of hosting for users to reach willing viewers? So somebody sets up uh, a, 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 twi a, a Twitter account and people go there ch because they want to see it. Somebody sets up a Facebook page or puts up a YouTube video and people go there because they want to see it. Should we treat them more like newspapers and magazines that have editorial discretion, which we value, or should we treat them more like phone companies or UPS or FedEx that are supposed to provide common carriage to all? So, um, so that's the policy thing. I want to just quickly, because I have uh, just a couple of minutes left, uh, talk briefly about the constitutional question, although again, one can talk a lot more about it. So I want to also start with another quote. This is also from a dissent by Justice Breyer. Um, and, uh, but on this point, I think the majority would have agreed. It's from the USA DVAOSI, the follow-up case. Um, requiring someone to host another person's speech is often a perfectly legitimate thing for the government to do. So, so I've often heard the argument, well, obviously it would be an unconstitutional speech compulsion to require a property owner to host other speech. I don't think that's right. I mean, the phone companies aren't like that. Uh, that is to say, the phone companies are, uh, are required to host a speech but are not seen as having a First Amendment right to say, no, we're going to cancel someone's phone, phone line. So again, here you can see a spectrum. Newspapers can't be required to publish replies to criticism of candidates because, again, they have constitutionally protected editorial discretion. A parade organizer can't be required to include floats it dislikes in its parade because when people go to see a parade, the parade is seen as the aggregate of all of the, of all the messages. People often watch it beginning to end or at least some point to another point. On the other hand, a shopping mall may be required to allow leafleters and signature gatherers, including leafleters who distribute offensive material or material that urges a boycott of stores in that very shopping mall. It's an interesting question whether that's a good rule. Remember that question mark at the end of, the, of, of my title. Maybe shopping malls shouldn't be regulated this way, but the Supreme Court has said that if a state wants to impose this rule, that's constitutional. Cable system may be required to carry broadcast channels. And of course, in Rumsfeld v. Fair, university may be required to allow military recruiters. And by the way, not just as a condition of funding, which is what happened in Rumsfeld v. Fair, but just as a categorical rule, which is something that the court told us in Rumsfeld v. Fair would be permissible. And the distinction that is offered in some of these cases is that the is why, for example, is a cable system different from a parade? The programming offered on various channels by a cable network consists of individual unrelated segments that happen to be transmitted together for individual selection by members of the audience. I think that's very much descriptive of what Facebook or Twitter or YouTube is like with respect to the millions or billions of items available there. So I'm going to close with just one, just kind of one, one, uh, one point. So I think as a constitutional matter, at least uh, requiring common carry just as this hosting function is consistent with the First Amendment. The big question mark for me is as to the policy matter. That virtually, it's hard to imagine, or uh, uh, it, it's hard to imagine regulation that doesn't have the opportunity to make things worse. And this is an area where, in fact, regulating things might make things worse. I'm far from certain that trying to impose this common carriage obligation is a good policy idea. But I do think it's probably constitutional if done right, and it's something we ought to be thinking about. Thank you. I am very impressed. You had 15 seconds left. Oh, well, I'll say, I'm going to save that for a bottle. <laughs> Take it, 15 seconds? <laughs> I'll take your, I'll take his 15 seconds. I'll need, I'll need it. Until the 1950s, when African Americans traveled in the South, they were so restricted in the hotels and restaurants that would serve them that they bought the Green Book, a guide to hotels and other services who would do business with them. This was at least, this was at best an imperfect private solution to a serious public problem. Through a combination of state laws, private prejudice and private violence, combined with a lack of government protection. A vital national privilege of African American citizens was being abridged. It was the privilege known as the right to travel. Tragically, this abridgment had been made possible by decisions of the U.S. Supreme Court, 
To combat the organized white supremacy that arose in the wake of slavery's abolition, Republicans in the 39th Congress enacted the 14th Amendment. Then, in 1875, they used the enforcement power of Section 5 to prohibit just this type of discrimination in non-government-owned places of public accommodation. But eight years later, in the civil rights cases, the Supreme Court held that the civil rights law to be unconstitutional on the grounds that it barred discrimination by non-governmental actors. The regime of organized white supremacy lasted for 90 years until the Civil Rights Act of 1964, in which Congress once again barred discrimination in places of public accommodations. It was this law and the subsequent regime of federal enforcement that finally broke the back of Jim Crow. Because of its precedent in the civil rights cases, however, the court upheld the 1964 Act based on Congress's commerce power, rather than on its Section 5 power to ensure the equal protection of the privileges or immunities of citizenship. The Civil Rights Act of 1964 passed with a higher percentage of Republican support in both the Senate and House than Democrat. Without that support, the act would have died. Yet some Republicans, most prominently Senator Barry Goldwater, objected to its constitutionality because it barred discrimination by privately owned business. Republicans have been tarred by this association ever since. In 1875, of course, it was Democrats, not Republicans, who raised this constitutional objection. Understanding why Republicans thought such a measure was constitutional is useful today. In our new book, The Original Meaning of the 14th Amendment, its letter and spirit, on sale after this uh, program and to be uh, in a signing ceremony, Evan Burnick and I spent two chapters explaining the concept of Republican citizenship embodied in Section 1 of the 14th Amendment. To understand the privileges of Republican citizenship, we must distinguish between two binaries, the public-private binary and the government-non-government -government binary. It is commonly assumed that these two binaries are identical. By this I mean there exist just two categories, public governmental on the one hand and private non-governmental on the other. But once we distinguish them as two distinct binaries, however, we can see how the concept of national citizenship that was adopted and reshaped by the newly formed Republican Party could, not, could see not just two, but three categories. In between the categories of public governmental and private non-governmental is the category of public non-governmental. Such a category can be located in the common law governing inns and common carriers. After the 14th Amendment, it sometimes went by the label businesses affected with a public interest. Unlike purely private non-governmental actors, such businesses could be subject to price controls and to a non-discrimination norm. The boundaries of this middle category, whatever it be called, were not always easy to discern, and there are different ways to conceptualize and justify it. Sometimes these privately owned companies receive public charters. Sometimes they exercise the power of eminent domain. Sometimes they could be viewed as a monopoly. Sometimes, while not individually a monopoly, through a mixture of common prejudice reinforced by private violence, they would have the practical power of a single monopoly. This is what African Americans confronted when they traveled through the South before 1964, a phalanx of non-governmental public service providers refusing to sell them the essential means to travel within a whole swath of the United States. Many of these providers were motivated by bigotry. Some were just obeying the law and still others were coerced by the threat of violence by private actors who were given free reign by local law enforcement officials. Whatever their motivations, this regime of public governmental and non-governmental actors was able to restrict the means by which African Americans could exercise a fundamental privilege of national citizenship, which is the right to travel. In describing this history, I do not mean to be equating the current situation of today's political dissenters from progressive orthodoxy with that of African Americans during Jim Crow. Still, the conceptual categories that explain why the Republicans believed that their 1875 Civil Rights Bill was constitutional may be useful to appreciate the challenge posed today by privately owned social media companies. Let us begin with the nature of the right that is at issue. As we explain in our book, the privileges or immunities of citizens our citizens of the United States are the civil rights that every person receives from the government to secure the pre-existing natural rights they enjoyed in the state of nature. In the words of the Declaration, it is to secure these rights that one leaves the state of nature to enter a civil society. 
In return for their allegiance, government owes every citizen a duty to protect these fundamental rights. This duty is expressly enshrined in the Equal Protection Clause, or, the, or what we call the Equal Protection of the Laws Clause. In sum, civil rights are the government guarantees of our natural rights, along with any other rights that are necessary to protect these rights, such as, for example, the right of trial by jury, which Madison said was, quote, as essential to secure the liberty of the people as any one of the pre-existing rights of nature. The right to travel was considered to be a privilege or immunity of national citizenship in 1868, and is so still considered today. The freedom of speech is another well-recognized privilege of US citizenship that was protected by the Privileges or Immunities Clause from being abridged by state laws. The freedom of speech expressed in the First Amendment protects the very same natural right we possess against our fellow citizens. Contrary to the civil rights cases, the Equal Protection of the Laws Clause imposes a duty on state governments to protect this fundamental right from being infringed not only by states, but also by non-state actors. When states fail to, to, do, to provide this protection, Congress can exercise its Section 5 powers to fill that gap, which brings us to privately owned social media platforms. Just as privately owned restaurants and hotels are public accommodations reached via government-owned highways, privately owned social media platforms might be considered public accommodations, and I say might be considered public accommodations that are accessed through the internet. Just as no one is compelled to open a restaurant or hotel to the public, no one is compelled to create a public forum for the expression of speech. It is to their credit that privately owned companies like Facebook and Twitter have successfully created a communications platform that because it is so user friendly, has come to be as, as essential to exercising the fundamental privileges of freedom of speech as privately owned restaurants and hotels are to the privilege of traveling. By virtue of their market success, they might be viewed as businesses affected with a public interest or public accommodations akin to restaurants and hotels. They might be seen as being in that middle category of non-governmental public institutions. Such institutions are typically regulated by the states. For example, the District of Columbia's public accommodation laws makes it unlawful, quote, to deny directly or indirectly any person the full and equal enjoyment of the goods, services, facilities, privileges, advantages, and accommodations of any place of public accommodation, wholly or partially for the discriminatory reason based on the actual or perceived political affiliation of any individual. All, would take, all, all it would take for a state to extend this non-discrimination prohibition to social media platforms would be to define a social media platform that is open to the general public as a place of public accommodation, and then add political viewpoint to the list of improper bases for exclusion. Recognizing the right to express oneself on political issues as a privilege of national citizenship, protected by the First and Fourteenth Amendment, is easy. More challenging is whether to define social media platforms as places of public accommodation. For example, the Civil Rights Act of 1875 distinguished between public inns and private boarding houses, which were owner-occupied. Like boarding houses, truly private networks, for example, uh, the Georgetown Listserv or the Federal Society Listservs, are not places of public accommodation. But the universal nature of social media companies seems to place them on the public accommodation side of the line. Now, instead of thinking of them as non-governmental public accommodations, however, perhaps it would be clarifying to label them non-governmental public forums. These are forums that, unlike newspapers or radio programs, are open to members of the general public to express their views. How, many such, how may such non-governmental public fora properly be regulated? The label suggests that First Amendment doctrine now governing public forums provided by government might provide doctrinal guideposts. An online public non-governmental forum can certainly limit the subject matter of discussion. Subject matter regulations is a form of content regulation, but a permissible one. A forum devoted to rock climbing can exclude posts on rock music. Such a forum would, in short, be considered a limited public non-governmental forum. What about other forms of speech? Say, speech that harasses another member of the forum. I suggest that, to the extent a private company has created a forum to the, for the public to communicate their ideas, such a company is limited to barring speech that the Supreme Court has found to be unprotected from government restriction. If a governmentally, if a gov, if a governmentally provided public forum 
cannot restrict such speech, then neither can a non-governmentally provided public forum. Categories of unprotected speech include fraud, incitement to imminent lawlessness, personal threats of violence or other unlawful harassment, obscenity, and child pornography. Just as government can ban these forms of speech, so too can non-government public forums. In this sense, we can say that the First Amendment does sometimes apply to private parties. We often hear the First Amendment doesn't apply to private parties. In this sense, perhaps First Amendment doctrine should apply to private parties. via the Equal Protection Clause of the 14th Amendment. It applies to those private parties who have created a public forum. A power to protect the freedom to speak in non-governmental public forums does not entail a power to compel people to speak. Facebook is free to express its own corporate opinions and cannot be compelled to endorse any particular idea. But unlike other companies, Facebook provides members of the public with a space or forum in which to express their views which is exactly what draws the public in to view the advertising from which Facebook derives much of its income. If this qualifies Facebook as a common carrier, a place of a public accommodation, or a non-governmental public forum, then it may not discriminate against speakers on the basis of their political identity or viewpoint. It may only prohibit unprotected expression, provided it does so even-handedly. Conservatives and libertarians rightly oppose much governmental restrictions on how private companies do business. They also rightly oppose governments regulating the speech that can, be, that can be conveyed on social media platforms, which the left is now pushing for in Congress. But conservatives and libertarians also rightly love the First Amendment that protects the natural right of freedom of speech. Viewing non-governmental social media platforms as places of public accommodation or as public forums does not justify the government suppressing constitutionally protected speech on those platforms. It is Orwellian to equate protecting the freedom of speech of individuals who wish to speak on social media platforms with the suppression of speech on the grounds that both are regulations of speech. To conclude, I'm going to conclude, I have not reached any final opinion, like, like Eugene, I have not reached any final opinion on whether to regulate social media companies as public accommodations or public forums. But I do think we need to stop thinking in terms of the binaries of the public, private, and government, non-governmental. The anti-slavery constitutionalists and the Republicans who wrote the 14th Amendment recognized the existence in civil society of three categories, not two. So too do our current civil rights laws that are deemed to be sacrosanct. And so too should libertarians and conservatives. Thank you. Thank you, Randy. Next, we have Adam. <laughs> uh, Professor Barnett's perceptive, and I'm sure to be highly, I'm sh sure to be highly influential analysis of Republican citizenship, as well as his discussion of the Supreme Court's opinion in the civil rights cases, moved me to recall the opinions only dissent, which I'm sure most of you in the audience will remember. It's Justice Harlan's, one of the great dissents in American legal history. In it, Harlan argued that the federal government, in fact, did have the power um, under the Civil Rights Act of 1875 to mandate non-discriminatory non treatment, um, to quote the opinion, in accommodations and facilities of inns, public conveyances, and places of public amusement, end quote. As I understand Professor Barnett, he argues that equality merely within the governmental sphere is not enough for full citizenship in society and full participation in liberal democracy. Rather, citizens must have the chance to engage fully in the public sphere as well. I think Harlan's dissent has clear parallels um, to Professor Barnett's position. To quote Harlan, quote, the one underlying purpose of congressional legislation has been to enable the black race to take the rank of mere citizen and to secure the enjoyment of privileges belonging under law to them as a component part of the people for whose welfare and happiness government is ordained. Today, it is the colored race which is denied by corporations and individuals wielding public authority rights fundamental to their freedom and citizenship. At some future time, it may be some other race. And the Harlan dissent offers important insights to the, to the panel's topic, private control and uh, private control over public discussion. 
First, the dissent recognizes that corporations and individuals wielding public authority can interfere with citizens and rights fundamental in their freedom and, um, in their freedom and citizenship. And that's precisely our question. Whether Facebook's, Google's, and Twitter's, um, hold on. Facebook is one of the supporters of today's event. Is that, I think that's correct. Okay, let's just focus on, on Google and Twitter. Uh, <laughs> um, so that's precisely our question, whether Google and Twitter's censoring of the Hunter Biden tapes, the bizarre deplatforming and censoring of information critical of public health authorities, their targeting of competitor firms with different ideological outlooks, such as Parler, constitutes, to use Harlan's phrase, corporations and individuals wielding public authority to interfere with rights fundamental to freedom and citizenship. Second, the dissent has direct application to the regulation of communications technology. One of Harlan's dissent's main arguments for the Civil Rights Act of 1875's constitutionality is that the federal government has the power to regulate common carriers and other industries affected with the public interest. He concludes, I think rightly, that this common carrier power extends to the areas of the Civil Rights, uh, extends to the areas the Civil Rights Acts of 1875 um, covers, namely accommodations and facilities of inns, public conveyances, and places of public amusement. And it is not surprising that the 19th century courts classified the then new technologies, such as telegraphy and telephony, as common carriers. These courts recognized that non-discriminatory access to communications technology was just like railroads, ferries, and inns, a vital part of citizenship. The logic of Harlan's dissent supports the position that some types of social media regulation, therefore, um, social media is simply the, the telephone of the 21st century, is appropriate to maintain and strengthen our democracy. Well, um, then what are we talking about when it comes um, to social media and big tech regulation? You know, and I realize that speaking in favor of government regulation at, at, at the FedSoc National Convention is not the wisest course. Uh, libertarian lightning may come and strike me down. Um, so let's begin with a, a basic principle of regulatory economics, at least as I, as I learned it. Government should only in interfere when there is a market failure. With that principle, with which I, I think even the most ardent laissez fairist would agree, can we justify social media regulation? Well, as a first response, I'm going to evade the question. Because with regard to social media and Google, this question may not be apt. The question assumes that regulated parties are market actors that are concerned is market failure. I think it's fair to say that the large social media firms are not simply market actors, but also political actors. Indeed, no one can look at the election of 2020, the suppression of the Hunter Biden tapes, um, the, I, I would say, conspiracy against Parler, the deplatforming of, of a duly elected president on Twitter, um, or Karen platform behavior, deplatforming people who disagree with public health authorities, or the newest one, disagreeing with the so-called climate change consensus. Um, and not see political ideology and preference playing a driving role. When our country's major communications networks discriminate against the views of one half of America, this is a political favor. Uh, this is a political failure, not simply an economic failure. And let's be honest, um, that one half of America um, against whom they're discriminating includes a lot of people in this room. Um, I know you, I recognize you, and I, I, I would think if trends continue, you know, you'll be deplatformed. I, I suspect I will. Um, uh, but um, beyond um, these more you know, partisan interests, I think um, there's a reason why people should be interested um, in this political failure. Why? Because markets depend upon the rule of law, and without democratic and functioning governmental institutions, the rule of law will, will erode. Second, directly responding to the question of market failure, I think there is um, indeed a market failure here. And while given the number of antitrust specialists in this room, I'm a little bit hesitant to make too broad claims, um, but I think few would doubt that mark big, big tech platforms exercise some type of market power, and many would claim that this market power is sufficient to be a violation of the antitrust laws. Third, um, we must be honest and recognize that you know, we do not understand online behavior perfectly, or even well. Um, and that it may not obey the predictions that classical economic assumptions would make. Much research suggests that platforms use um, techniques to encourage addiction and to keep our eyeballs on their screens looking at their advertisements. 
We know that social media is highly correlated with depression and mental illness, particularly for teenage girls. The rate of mental illness of depression is the highest we've ever seen in our history, and it correlates very strongly with social media use. Um, so the choice of, to use social media could be like drug use, an example of hyperbolic discounting where users value immediate pleasure too highly compared to subsequent disutility. And just as Odysseus asked his men to regulate him um, by tying him to the mask while sailing through the, you know, the singing sirens, so we must regulate ourselves um, when using social media. So if I got um, the true libertarians out there um, in the audience uh, to the position of maybe, perhaps, possibly, some type of regulation is appropriate, um, what would this regulation look like? Conservative advocates favor the most mild type of social media regulation. Um, and I think this is found in, 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 in the um, social media law, I think the best one is passed, um, that of the state of Texas. These regulations include anti-discrimination requirements of the sort which local phone, airplanes, and other common carriers function to this day without much comment or concern. Under these regulations, firms cannot refuse service on the basis of race, religion, or political affiliation, but must serve any customer who will accept their offered services. A state could impose this type of mandate under its common carriage or public accommodation jurisdictions. There are legal issues, um, social, media social, law social media laws regulating social media present. Um, they've already been examined to some degree, well, quite well, by Professor Volokh and um, by Professor Barnett, and I'm sure we'll, we'll continue that discussion um, in, in, in the Q&A that follows. Um, but as a prelude to the discussion, um, I will bring up a, a, a largely forgotten case, but one of my personal favorites. Um, as a communications lawyer, um, I guess we're entitled to somewhat idiosyncratic preferences. And that's a 1896 uh, United, United States Supreme Court case, Western Union v. James, certainly not as famous as the civil rights case. This case reviewed a claim that a Georgia law regarding telegraph delivery um, of telegraphs that could emanate from outside, the, outside of Georgia, but delivered within the state, um, was unconstitutional. Western Union argued that the law interfered with the federal government's power under the Commerce Clause. Um, the Georgia law read, in relevant part, it is hereby enacted by authority of the same um, that every electric telegraph company um, shall transmit and deliver its telegraphs with impartiality and good faith. The U.S. Supreme Court upheld Georgia's law. And of course, the First Amendment um, was not even considered. Um, it was a different, different time in, in First Amendment jurisprudence. Um, the case led to widespread state regulation to ensure timely, impartial, and non-discriminatory delivery of telegraphs. The conservative social media laws ask no more than the Georgia statute at issue in Western Union v. James. We seek to have messages impartially delivered. It seems to me what made sense in 1896 still makes sense today. Thank you. Thank you, Adam. Thank you. And last, we have Jane, who's going to be the contrarian. Yes, I am here to defend the status quo. <laughs> It's a dirty job. I'll do my best. Uh, I also reserve the right to change my mind. It sounds like we're all sort of saying some version of this, that none of us are totally sure what is best in this. Uh, we're, we're, in a, we're in a real pickle. Uh, but still, I don't see sufficient reason for lawmakers to interfere with Facebook or Twitter or any other social media company when they remove content or even users for their platforms. Uh, I am quite sympathetic to the positions that, that each of my colleagues has, has staked out so far. I'm, I'm also kind of a unlikely defender of these companies because I actually don't even use Twitter or Facebook that much. They don't give a lot of value to me in my life. Uh, and I agree they've been too deferential to the sort of elite establishment, more liberal point of view. Uh, and it all also really bothers me. There is some moral failing. that it, it bothers me that a lot of times content is removed not because the people who saw the content on the platforms found it objectionable, but because others who never received it on the platform find it objectionable that it was on the platform being enjoyed and consumed by somebody. Uh, that dynamic is, you know, um, uh, removing content for that reason uh, is is repugnant for in most circumstances, I think, to me. Nevertheless, 
I think something like a public accommodation or must carry rule for these platforms would be unconstitutional, but also bad policy. So first of all, uh, I, I think content moderation is clearly an expressive activity. So in Eugene's chart, it, it's somewhere pretty high in, in the uh, pecking order. And that's because users of social media in their role as, as listeners are selecting social media platforms in part based on the curation and, and house rules of the platform. Now, I want to be really clear. I'm not saying that they, that, that users, um, you know, that content moderation is a, is a main factor, an even an, a, a very important factor that attracts people to the platform. I, I know that other users and the sort of content that they're likely to see are the most important factors. Uh, I also don't mean uh, that users want social media to have a really heavy-handed approach to content moderation. Uh, to the contrary, I think we understand that, that one of the more unique and valuable uh, qualities of social media is that the users themselves have a lot of power over the type of information that they wind up seeing. They control the content by picking who they're going to follow, who their friends are, and then also sort of passively by engaging and you know commenting on or liking certain content that winds up feeding into an algorithm that gives them more of that sort of content. Um, nevertheless, they do, we do, outsource some of the preliminary editing work uh, that has to be done to maintain some minimum standard of decency on, on any platform. And these minimum standards are important. They're the reasons that all of us, maybe, or at least most of us, aren't on 8chan, right? So to give a sense of how important these are, keep in mind that even small changes in the newsfeed algorithm on Facebook or Twitter winds up causing big differences in how long and how much people engage with the platform. Now, I know the term engagement has come to you know, have a pretty negative connotation in the sort of anti-tech uh, uh, media uh, portrayal as if engagement is you know, something that's sort of extracted involuntarily from people. Adam alluded that to this a little bit. It may be true to some extent. Uh, but on the other hand, every expressive media is trying to engage listeners and will go to some lengths of, of manipulation, somewhere in the scale of manipulation to do so. So to me, the fact that Facebook users are quite sensitive to the curation choices and, uh, and content moderation choices of a platform suggests that, um, that users really are in control. Listeners are in control here, and that if Facebook weren't able to clean up uh, some of the uh, really offensive and objectionable content, uh, and people's news feeds were, if not inundated, even occasionally interrupted by that content that, that they find obnoxious or indecent, uh, they would leave, or they would at least spend much less time on Facebook. So, uh, so, so that means that Facebook is giving a, a curated speech experience their house rules are, you know, they are inconsistently enforced. They're enforced probably with bias. I, 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 I agree uh, with the panelists here. Um, but they are still closely linked to the user's taste for speech, taste for some minimum quality standard for speech. And so that makes it more like a parade organizer or a bookstore, I think, than, than, than some of the other uh, analogies. Um, by the way, I also do think that Facebook and Twitter do a lot of curation and censorship based on concerns related to safety, to societal harm rather than their users' taste. Uh, this too might be expressive. Uh, I, I think I take quite a different read of Pruneyard, and maybe I'll put a pin in that and we can talk about it a little bit, but I think that uh, can help explain why public accommodations law does not would not uh, forbid um, Facebook or any other platform from uh, removing uh, speakers who are engaged in speech on their platform that they find harmful. Okay, so second, if, if you agree with me that, that platforms curation decisions are at least to some extent expressive, then it means that a legal mandate to carry messages that they don't otherwise want to carry could only be justified if listeners or users are basically locked into one speech platform to the exclusion of other either existing or potentially you know, future uh, platforms. Uh, courts are comfortable occasionally requiring speech platforms to host 
disfavored speakers, but that only happens when the court is convinced that listeners uh, are only gonna, going to encounter a particular type of media in, in one place. So it explains why a company town, for example, has to give a, be a venue for uh, disfavored speakers or licensed radio broadcasters, why that they would have to come under some sort of legal obligation to provide access to speakers. Uh, so it might seem like Facebook and Twitter have locked in their users sufficiently, uh, especially because the court seems willing to acknowledge that lock-in effects can be kind of behavioral or even sort of um, irrational. So. Um, Turner Broadcasting uh, was a case where the Supreme Court uh, decided that cable, uh, cable has to carry local broadcasting. And the reason was that they thought that it would be unlikely that people would physically change a plug in the back of their TV to switch from cable to local broadcast and then switch it back. So if that was enough for the Turner Court, it seems like, okay, well, having all your family and friends in one place on Facebook and having a profile that you've already invested a lot of time in with pictures and content and whatnot, that probably will feel like lock, like you're pretty locked into Facebook. Uh, I don't think that's enough, though. Uh, so in part, um, it's in, in part I have to admit that I, I'm just not totally convinced that Turner and Red Lion hang together with other better reasoned cases like like Turnilo. So you can you know take this with some grain of salt. But but uh, there are all sorts of inertia and sunk costs that affect speakers and listeners. So those who subscribe to the New York Times are just not likely to, ever, to bother checking out other newspapers, uh, especially if they haven't seen content that they object to on the New York Times. Uh, and, and yet a, no court would, would sort of intervene uh, uh, on the basis that, that, that they're locked in. Um, so, so, so that is enough in my mind to already raise doubts that even if Facebook locks in its users, that still might not be enough on its own to justify a mandate. Uh, but in any case, Facebook doesn't lock in its, its users. Here, here I, I disagree with, with Adam. Um, it's not in a position where it can rest on its dominance. Uh, the users discipline Facebook all the time and, and Twitter too, um, not, not by leaving altogether in a, in a sort of noisy, um, noisy protest, but, but rather just by reducing the amount of time that they spend there and choosing other online platforms or even uh, going to do something else altogether. Uh, so if Facebook didn't reflect the values and minimum taste requirements of its users, it would lose their attention. And looking at Facebook and, and Twitter's behavior over the last few years, I see desperate media companies, uh, not that different from the traditional media companies who are desperately trying to figure out what their median user wants and what their edge users will tolerate or even demand in terms of, of censorship and, and promotion. Uh, so th those aren't the behaviors of a monopolist. Uh, okay, so fi finally, and I know I'm close to my end of my time, I, I, I'm also, even if I were convinced that, the, that a must-carry rule is, is good policy, I don't see how it can be administrable. So, uh, so first of all, uh, as, as Randy mentioned, a, a platform would be able to proactively purge illegal content, but the edges of, of the boundaries of what some of the categories of illegal content are really quite murky. You know, what it means to be incitement, what harassment means, what material support means even. Um, th these are hard to identify with certainty and so we're likely to, uh, to get a lot of litigation. But also I just wonder about things like uh, troll farms, right? Um, the Russian uh, it, you know, internet research agency uh, that creates overtly political content that listeners seem to want and engage with um, and yet are, are inauthentic speakers. So is that something that would have to be tolerated on, on, on a platform? Um, spamming is another concern. Uh, so, so I think by the time we're done with this, we'd have such Byzantine kind of time, place, and manner rules on, on, these, on these platforms that uh, we'd see a constant stream of litigation. And, and more importantly, though, I think that they just might break the companies that we claim are the public square. You know, if there's too much content that users don't want to see, they and the advertisers are going to move to smaller forums that are not under this regulation. And so uh, there goes... Uh, the public forum. All right, thank you very much. Thank you, Jane. Well, I think we have a lot to talk about. I think uh, everyone has 
sort of the same consensus, which is no one really knows what we should do. <laughs> That's the one thing we agree on. Um, now, it's, it's interesting to me, Jane, that you talked about um, people can go to other social platforms, but the reality is, is what are the other social platforms? Because Twitter uh, is the platform for most people to communicate. Uh, then you have uh, Google, which controls 90% of the market share. So it, it does become an issue, which is where, where does someone else go? if you are deplatformed or you're canceled on Twitter? Yeah, well, so, so I, I personally have followed deplatformed people to Substack. So I think there are, it's a different, I get that it's, it's not really social media. It's not social in the way the others. I mean, it wouldn't be the modern public square. It would be sort of like a, a little sort of, you know, off Broadway. Off, yeah, <laughs> right, right. But, but, but I, I think the parlor experience is a really good one to focus on for a second. Uh, so, so many people, so there are many ways and angles to view uh, what happened in the aftermath of the great deplatforming. But the fact is 15 million people joined Parler in a very short amount of time. And right at the height of that momentum, Parler was stopped, but not by Facebook and not by Twitter, right? They were stopped by Apple and Google who control the, the, the smartphones and they were stopped by the cloud service firms of Amazon and, and other cloud servers. So there may, may be an antitrust problem there, but I think the fact that, that, um, that users who are upset about content moderation show such willingness to move so quickly um, is, is a sign that there is an appetite for competition here. Uh, and, and I know 15 million is m many fewer than uh, the number of people who, who subscribe to President Trump's Twitter account. I, I, I understand that. But, but you, you know, that, I guess that takes me to my, the, the ultimate conclusion that part of the reason that some people won't switch to Parler is because Parler has uh, promoted itself as a place with no or very minimal house rules. Uh, that, that matters. I, I, I think some some people will just be reluctant to go to a platform. Many people will go to, be reluctant to join a platform with no house rules. I'm going to uh, bring this to, to Adam. Um, I'd like to talk to you about an amicus brief that you filed um, in a state court case called Ohio versus Google. Can you discuss uh, a little bit the facts of that case and what your amicus position is? Because uh, to me, it's, it's sort of interesting that the when I read the amicus and I read the complaint in that case, how, you know, I think of Google just as what it does, but it really is involved in, it owns part of the, the infrastructure. Uh, it owns a lot of different things and it's, it's tangled up in a lot of what we consider to be the components or how you put together the mo modern public square. And it's not just the Google, the search engine. Right. I mean, I think Google is the central directory for the modern economy and, 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 and really our culture. Um, that's where people go to find information and direct themselves. Um, so I, I think that's a very natural and correct intuition. Um, and uh, I, the suit flows from that intuition. Um, once again, we're back to obscure 19th century common law, um, common carrier law. Um, and in many states, um, uh, Courts retain the power to declare firms common carriers and subject them to um, common carrier regulations, just the judge doing it him or herself, which you might, you might like, judge. Um, and uh, so using these old cases, um, uh, uh, Attorney General Yost of Ohio brought such an action against, uh, against Google. Um, and uh, you know, I, I think he has a very good claim uh, because I think Google does play that central role um, that the telephone, that the telegraph, that the railroad played in, in earlier generations. Um, and that's you know, pretty straightforward suit. Do, do you think other states are going to follow suit uh, as Ohio did? Well, a lot depends upon <coughs> excuse me, the peculiarities of um, the state law. Ohio just happened to have um, this common law um, continuance of, of, of judicial authority. But, you know, th there are plenty of other states. Um, and if there are any state AGs out there who want to talk, I'm, I'm available after, after the panel. 
I'm going I'm to stay with you, Adam, for a second, because I want to talk about the article that you wrote, <coughs> Bargaining for Free Speech, Common Carriage, Network Neutrality, and Section 230. It was cited by Justice Thomas in his concurrence in Biden versus Knight First Amendment. Um, and in that concurrence, he raised the possibility of treating online tech platforms as common carriers or public utilities from a constitutional regulatory perspective. Um, can you set, can you sort of talk to the audience for those who are not familiar with either your article or Justice Thomas's concurrence about sort of where the First Amendment fault lines come into play with regard to private companies regulating user content? Sure. So the, um, uh, the, the statement, and it was a statement concerning a denial of sociority. It wasn't a part of an opinion. Um, but it, it actually tracks very well the discussion that we're having right now. Um, the case involved uh, the, a, a, um, a, an issue that um, concerning whether or not President Trump's personal Twitter account was a public forum. And as you remember from the First Amendment law, if it's a public forum, um, there are limited powers of the government to, to censor or to limit speakers. Um, the <coughs> court dismissed the certiorari um, petition as moot because, of course, we have a different person in the White House now. Um, but Justice Thomas took this opportunity um, in a, and I should say, very um, and, not just because the, my, my, my article was cited, but because it was a truly scholarly discussion. I mean, I learned a lot. There was references to, to, to cases that I haven't heard of. Um, uh, to, to rehash some of the issues that were brought up here, which is what are the roles of private entities when they assume essentially a public role in democratic uh, discourse? Eugene, um, y you mentioned, and, and so did Randy, um, that neither of you have reached a final opinion as to whether social media companies should be regulated as public accommodations. And personally, as the child of uh, people who fled Cuba, regulation by the government makes me a little nervous. Um, so if, we, if there were to be regulations um, of digital platforms, how do you envision them working, or how do you envision the enforcement regime working? Uh, sure. So it's, it's a very good question. I, I don't really fully know the answer. I do want to suggest there are two separate questions here. Uh, just to remind people, I mean, it's obvious there are, but it's a worth, a worth a remembering. One is, what First Amendment constraints are there on this? So for example, the First Amendment allows people, uh, allows states and, the, and Congress to impose uh, rights of access to others' property, even in the absence of any monopoly or quasi-monopoly. Uh, Turner Broadcasting involved something that, that, that did talk a little bit about monopoly, but Prunier, you know, shopping centers, there are lots of shopping centers out there. Uh, Rumsfeld v. Fair involved access to universities, which are not monopolies. Um, so, uh, so as a First Amendment matter, it may be perfectly permissible to, uh, to impose uh, uh, restrictions even on entities that don't have a lot of market power compared to, uh, uh, compared to the market as a whole. Um, on the other hand, as a policy matter, I think the more we can leave to competition, the better. So one possibility that people have been talking about that's an interesting possibility, though in some respects much more radical in the, the change that it would, would create to, to, the, uh, to, to, to the structure of these things, is a, a requirement of interoperability. So with phone companies, they're partly non-monopolies because I can call anybody using my phone company, regardless of what phone company they're on. If phone companies only provided access within their network, then it would be pretty likely because of network effects that one company would, would end up dominating everything because nobody would want to join the competitor because they wouldn't be able to call their friends in the competitor. So you could imagine a regime where Facebook and Twitter, for example, had to provide interoperability, which is to say that if MeWe, a competitor to Facebook or Parler, a competitor to Twitter, comes up, then they could deliver things to people who are on other networks and can receive things from people who are on other networks. And that would make it easier for upstarts to be created. And somebody could, in part because somebody could move to an upstart without losing access to all of their friends on, on the other platform. So you could imagine that as a sort of uh, content neutral rule that might better harness the power of a marketplace rather than purely the power of regulation. This having been said, I'm sure there are lots of both technical issues and economic issues having to do with 
that, and certainly Facebook and Twitter might say we invested billions of dollars in creating our, net, our networks in a way that were not, was not open to third parties, uh, and we are entitled to preserve that investment without this kind of uh, uh, very massive structural regulation. But that's one possible alternative that some people have been talking about. Try to make sure that there are going to be many more competitors, and the way to do that has to be through some sort of interoperability requirement. Randy, do you have a response? Uh, um, here's one way to think about it. Um, Eugene works for UCLA, a, a government-run school, state-owned school. I work for Georgetown, a private university. This means that Eugene has certain First Amendment protections at UCLA. At Georgetown, I don't have First Amendment protections because it's a private university. The idea that Georgetown would be subjected to the same kind of free speech requirements, I'm not proposing this by the way, but the idea that Georgetown would be subjected to the same kind of free speech protections that UCLA is, doesn't strike me as that radical a proposal. I mean, I don't think it would be a radical result. Um, it, I don't think it's necessary or proper <coughs> to do that with the universities, frankly. So I don't, because they're not common carriers, they're not public forum, they don't fit the, quali the criteria. So I'm not, I'm just using it as an analogy. Um, our conditions of employment are not that different. Georgetown actually does honor free speech. We have a free speech policy. It's voluntary in the sense that it's not mandated by the government. But I think what we're, what we're, what I, I'm not actually, we're not proposing, but what we're open to, or like what I'm open to the suggestion is, is that a private entity like Facebook, Twitter, and UCLA would be subject to constraints provided by the First Amendment that UCLA is already subject to, but Facebook and Twitter are not. So it doesn't seem like it's that uh, uh, onerous. And at the same time, as Eugene has pointed out, and as I try to also point out, um, UCLA is free to, uh, uh, to regulate unprotected speech and to exclude unprotected speech. That would not violate the First Amendment. And UCLA cannot be made to speak by the government and, and say something that they don't believe in. And I think the same kind of constraints uh, should could, could, and the same sort of constraints should be imposed on regulations of these social media platforms if we're open to them. Well, let me, oh, I'm sorry, Jane, go ahead. Could I respond? Would it sure. be okay? Yes, of course. So, you know, even if we take that analogy, it's not clear whether Facebook is like a room within the within the university where there might be some programming that the university should be able to control, uh, you know, uh, the, what, what, what other speakers say, or whether it's more like the mall, the open mall on the campus where uh, almost anything goes. And so I th think even the analogy uh, leaves, leaves some uh, open issues. And, and I say this <laughs> as concern. I, 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 I mean, I guess the, the other concern is that online behavior really is different from in-person behavior. And I think we should just sort of put that on, on the, the, the table here, that when there's a loud and obnoxious ranter on a, the, the public lawn of a university, uh, I know this from personal experience because it was my grandfather. He was the guy that was like the loony yelling at people. And, and, and I was so, you know, everyone was, uh, all of the other family members were ashamed. But, but like you could watch, uh, you could watch people politely just route around him on the, on, on, uh, the internet, um, you know, speech is just, uh, it, 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 you know, toxic trolling speech is much more uh, common and less, there's less of sort of social signaling uh, and, and uh, embarrassment and, and, and less, less reason not to do it. Um, the, the other thing I want to say, though, about this analogy to, to, public, to public places of accommodation is that... Um, I, I think two things are going on. The public accommodations law prevents businesses from controlling access based on the status of the person who wants something. And there I would agree with Randy that if, if, if Facebook were to say, uh, I, I would be comfortable with a law that says that, if, if, if that Facebook could not deny someone access to a Facebook profile because they, are, because they subscribe to some sort of ideology. Uh, what, what's going on here, though, and in fact, what's happening is that the speech and behavior that is actually taking place on these fora are the reason that the platforms are or are not taking action. And so this is quite different. Uh, th this, even a public accommodations can kick people out for being obnoxious and rude or uh, for you know, disturbing their other patrons. 
right? So, e and even, uh, you know, e the, even the shopping center in Pruneyard, the, the entire case was premised on the idea, first of all, that it was a handful of orderly persons soliciting signatures, so order, that word orderly is, is important, I think. And then also that Pruneyard actually had no first, direct First Amendment interest. They actually did not object to the content of the leafleters. They objected as property owners rather than as a speech forum. And, and that, I think, really limits the, the how widely we should be interpreting that case to prevent a company that's trying to actually manage the speech that's being done uh, uh, on their platform. I, can I, can yes, I just uh, brief, briefly respond? So I think there, there's a lot to be said about all this, but uh, in, in, in support of what uh, Jane is saying. But I want to suggest uh, uh, one important distinction here. Um, and I mentioned this with a, when I was talking about the hosting function versus the comment management function. If I have a Facebook page, which I do, but I never monitor, but imagine that I had a Facebook page where I actually had people commenting. It would be really bad for our conversations if people could freely go up there, post vulgarities, post spam, post various other things. I could certainly imagine myself shutting down the Facebook page if people were intruding in those conversations this way. So I think there's a lot of value and possibly First Amendment protected value in this kind of moderation of comments on other people's pages. On the other hand, it means nothing to me that some Nazi who thinks that people like me should have been exterminated, happens to have a Facebook page. I mean, I'm upset that he's out there in a, some sense, but it's not something that interferes with my enjoyment of Facebook simply knowing that the Nazis out there. And if it did, then I don't think that that's sort of the kind of reasonable concern that, uh, that, that needs to be accommodated. To give an example, Twitter allows pornography. <coughs> there are porn Twitter feeds uh, out there. I don't think I've ever accidentally stumbled across one or this, had a this porn is new, This is new information. Uh, <laughs> I, 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 I've, learned, I've learned, I have 36,000 followers, but now I've learned something about well, there uh, you go. Twitter. There you go. Uh, so, so again, that kind of, uh, um, uh, uh, that kind of uh, uh, mere presence of something on the network doesn't really make it unusable, except in the sense that some people may militantly say, I refuse to do it, have anything to do with any property that has anything like that on it. And again, we don't view that as a reason to allow phone companies to block, uh, uh, to block lines. So, uh, so that's why I think it's important for us to distinguish attempts to moderate that are aimed at just removing things altogether, even when they're seen by willing viewers versus, re versus uh, blocking things, and especially spam, which needs to be blocked for things to be viable, uh, that appear on kind of uh, I, uh, on the, uh, the pages of people who didn't, didn't volunteer for that. Well, I, this is sort of, sort of going with, with that idea, and this goes to Randy and Jane, and then everyone else can join in, but um, I can't remember who it was. I think it was Randy who did. In, in defining social media companies, you talked about that these forums should be limited to barring speech that the Supreme Court has found to be unprotected from government restriction. And I'd like to focus on one of them in particular, which is the fraud category, okay? And fraud uh, is unprotected speech, but would social media companies be able to ban misinformation? Because my idea of misinformation may be your idea of information. And then who gets to decide what is misinformation and what is information? Because you have people who, I mean, now we're living in a, in a society where uh, it's Orwellian. And uh, I'm not sure I can call myself a woman anymore. So. Um, now, don't distract me, Judge. <laughs> the, um, the, <laughs> uh, as, I, as my con law two students, stu students will affirm, um, I make a very big point of, of, of observing to them that fraud is not the same thing as dishonest or false. Uh, fraud is a tort. Fraud has elements. Um, and you have to make out those elements uh, in order to uh, make a case of fraud. You can't go into court and sue somebody for saying something that's false. So the fraud that is unprotected is actual tort of fraud. Same thing with commercial speech. Commercial speech is regulated um, by a sep its own test, the Central Hudson test, and, um, and that commercial speech must not be misleading. But remember, that's misleading with respect to a commercial transaction, with respect to a commercial product. So I think those are, and so I can imagine that also could be something that uh, Facebook or Twitter could ban, 
misleading that would, would not be protected commercial speech. Uh, but I think these are, it's very important uh, when you make exceptions to liberty, uh, to, we make exceptions uh, to a presumption of liberty, to coin a phrase, um, that these exceptions have to be identifiable and uh, definable um, and then very limited. Otherwise, the exceptions will swallow the rule. That's the problem. That's the, that is the danger of making any exceptions. Right. On the other hand, we have always made exceptions. And so we cannot fail to make exceptions. The exception to freedom of contract is fraud, duress, unconscionability, um, uh, un, you know, incapacity. We have exceptions to freedom of contract. They just have to be limited. Jane, do you want to respond? Yeah, yeah. so I, I, mean, I agree with the description that, that fr fraud is quite narrow, that there are elements, that there are intent elements, there are harm elements, which actually a lot of the misinformation, you know, debates about misinformation sort of ignore what, you know, whether there's actually evidence of, of harm. Uh, that said, though, I am, I, I just, I, I'm more reluctant than Randy again uh, to want to prevent a private company from experimenting with uh, with with uh, intervening with misinformation or potential inf misinformation that might have harmful effects. Now, one reason one reason I say this is that my thinking about what has happened uh, in the so in in the wake of social media um, has sort of evolved over time, and I'm I'm convinced that when people are engaged on social media their interest in pursuing accuracy is sometimes in tension or conflict, direct conflict, with their interest in a sense of belonging and with socializing and, and with uh, you know, the reasons we sort of, uh, or the principal reason we, we, we many people uh, go onto social media in the first place. And so I am concerned about conspiracy theories, about false claims of various sorts that are, do not constitute fraud, uh, but that nevertheless cause harm, either internalities or externalities to, to, to other, other people. Uh, I, at the same time, uh, you know, I, I, right now, <laughs> we're not in the <coughs> equilibrium yet. <laughs> you know, right now, Facebook and Twitter are over-moderating. I, I, I think I'd, I'd agree with that. Uh, they're not, uh, they are, you know, they are making mistakes. They're taking a, a, a sort of authoritative position where they should not, where we should have much less, uh, we should have much more humility. Uh, and a good example is the lab theory of COVID, right, which was treated as misinformation and was, uh, was, uh, was um, removed uh, everywhere on social media and then later, <laughs> now it seems like it's so much more credible. Uh, but, but still, uh, still, I, I'm glad that we're, you know, in this very early phase Keep, can of... I, can I interrupt you for a second? Yeah. Because I, I'd like to address that point, okay. which is a lot of people, I'm not sure people in this room, but a lot of people, particularly uh, young people, teens, millennials, literally get their information and their news from this. Yeah. And mainly from Twitter. So when Twitter uh, takes down any and all information on anything, even a news source, that you then have to track down in order to see what someone actually said. Mm -hmm. That is really very problematic for uh, a country that's a democratic country uh, that believes in free speech and has uh, a constitutional right to freedom of speech. Yeah, that's how do, that, how do we address that? Error. Because that's, that is a, a problem. It's not so just misinformation, that's, that's but, from but, over. but literally taking down yeah. information and access to information. Yeah, I, I mean, so, so that, that's, the, that, that's the error on one side. On the other side, leaving things up, you know, given that teenagers get all their news from, from Twitter, that, that may have its own perverse uh, effects. Uh, you know, I, I actually, my preferred solution here, ironically, is to, um, to expand opportunity to go after speakers for, you know, basically take the model of fraud and create some sort of new, you know, yeah. negligent information sort of category so that, um, so that uh, those, who, you know, the speech that, that can provably, can, can be proven to have caused harm where the speaker knew or should have known um, that it was both wrong and, and likely to cause harm um, could, could, be, could be held uh, liable, and then that way there's much less pressure on the platforms to try to have to manage these things. But, Adam, I know you want to respond, but I think we uh, do. You, can you respond briefly? 
very brief. Well, okay. There's a long line. I okay. Defer to the, the I think we should start taking questions from the audience. Uh, Good morning. Good morning. Um, my name is Allison Hayward. Um, I am the um, case um, screening manager at the Facebook Oversight Board. Um, a lot of people are talking about content moderation here this morning. I actually do it. Um, mm -hmm. And I just want to say, first of all, this has been an excellent panel. There's not a lot of mature, grown-up analysis being done in this space, in my opinion, right now. And this is just emblematic of how we should be talking about these questions and questions that I live with every day. My question, though, is this. Um, we've been talking about American users on an American platform. I think U.S. users make up maybe 12% of the users on Facebook. Um, the vast majority of our appeals, however, come from the U.S., but that's another issue, I think, that's because Americans are confident and litigious. But anyway, um, so you've got a situation where you can't really bound Facebook geographically. Um, you can, Facebook can bound itself in a negative way by um, geocaching particular regions if, they, if they're being told they have to. But as regulators, how do you deal with the fact that we're talking about these wonderful First Amendment values that don't apply legally to most of the people using Facebook? Um, I think there's something missing in this conversation, and I would really like to hear some, some proposal for how you would propose to manage this. Would you say that there's one standard for users in the US and one standard for the rest of the world? Would you say that the rest of the world gets these wonderful First Amendment benefits that Americans have, which I treasure? Um, or is there some other way of coping with the fact that what we're talking about is an international body of people that really cannot be geographically bound? Thank you. Gene. So, so I've thought a little bit about this. and. Uh, I'm a big believer in geolocation and geofencing in a sense, in the following sense. When a company does business in many countries, it needs to abide by the laws of those countries. Some of those laws may be ones I don't like, and those countries may dislike some of the laws that we have here in the US. Uh, but it's not a serious imposition, it seems to me, in a company like Facebook or a company like Twitter that say that if you're operating in multiple countries, you have to have different rules for different countries. Fortunately, these days, there is good technology that with to a high degree of accuracy determines which country someone's coming from. And yes, there could be then a solution saying, look, Cartoons of Muhammad may be illegal in Saudi Arabia or in some other country. I don't know if they are, but let's say they are. Understandable, that's the way things are there. Uh, and uh, criticism of the Thai king is illegal in Thailand. I think that's very bad, but they're a, they're a sovereign country. And there should be, therefore, if Facebook wants to operate in those countries, there should be blocking like that there. Uh, but we should insist in America that they not enforce these rules here. Because the danger otherwise is that the more, most restrictive regimes, could be China, not all the companies operate there, but to the extent that some do, uh, China says, well, you have to block criticism of uh, Xi Jinping throughout the whole country, or, you ha or, uh, or throughout the whole world, excuse me. So I think it's perfectly sensible to have different rules. And just as I think Americans are entitled to speak subject to American law on Facebook, I wouldn't begrudge the French to insist that the Frenchmen be allowed to speak subject to French law on, on Facebook. And to the extent that that is somewhat burdensome <coughs> on a company, and I can see why it would be, that's just a burden that comes from operating in multiple countries. I, I have something, I think, really quick to add, and that is that if, if a privilege of immunity of citizens of the United States have been violated, that person is entitled to a remedy, either in state court and if the states, or in the, by state law, or if states don't do it, then federal government can do it. Um, and so if somebody is barred from F Twitter or Facebook who's an American citizen, they would exercise this cause of action that they would have either by statute or some other means. Um, and that would, I, that, and, that, and Facebook or Twitter would have violated their rights as an American. Uh, I don't think that this would give Congress the power under its Section 5 powers to have an extraterritorial law which would protect the rights of citizens of other states, of other countries. This would be a protection that would be afforded to Americans under the Constitution and asserted by them as individuals when their individual right has been violated. Does anyone else want to respond? Okay, next question. Um, hi, my name is Anthony Bruno. Um, so questions for the regulation curious panelists. 
it seems like there's a couple, th two different things going on here, and I just want to drill down on it. it seems like you, you may all be open to the idea of some affirmative legislation passed by Congress to restrict uh, or provide protection for the users on these platforms. Um, that might give some protection, but I also think that's quite unrealistic that we would actually see some legislation coming out of Congress, maybe you get something at the state level. But I think there's a second question, I think Professor Barnett's touching on it a little bit more in the context of the individual right of the user. Is, are, are, is the panel open to the idea that the user, absent some statute, giving them so, some protection, can actually go into court to vindicate their First Amendment rights as it would be, you know, if it was government controlled and they were deplatformed. Do we need a statutory protection here? Or are we saying there's a constitutional right that an individual could go into court to vindicate? Do you want to talk about that? James? So, yeah, so uh, right now, doing, doing nothing, I think, you know, do, if, if no other uh, statute is, is introduced, I think using a public accommodations law to make that sort of claim is almost certain, is almost, is bound to be a sure loser, especially because we do have federal, a federal statute, section 230, that, um, that pr protects or gives, gives, uh, you know, uh, that, that, yeah, protects a, a platform's interest in, in doing its own uh, content moderation, and so I think something would have to, at the state level, at least. Jane, can we talk a little bit about 230? Because we, we haven't really talked about that. Um, yeah. Because 230, when that came into being, it was at the beginning or the advent of this technology, and it was AOL and CompuServe, which obviously was a long time ago, and they don't <laughs> exist anymore. Um, yeah. So the question is, uh, the, the government gave these companies that, uh, that immunity yeah, uh, so the, without anything in return. Well, I, I mean, I wouldn't quite put it that way, but yeah, yeah. so the, the platforms in the early era, ages of the World Wide Web, the concern was that pl pl if platforms did anything active to remove bad content, il maybe illegal, maybe not illegal content, that that active engagement with the content would make it uh, susceptible to liability for as as a as a publisher for any content that was left up that was also illegal, defamatory, say. So, so you can see how something like Facebook wouldn't exist if any person who's ever been defamed could sue Facebook for failing to remove the post. Right. So, Section 230 um, was designed to encourage companies like Facebook or um, or they're the early progenitor progenitors from going ahead and actively removing bad or illegal content without having to worry about um, becoming a effectively a, a publisher. Uh, now today, I, I think there's, there's a big discussion about whether that's the right policy now that uh, the World Wide Web is, is well established and, the, and these platforms are, are clearly <laughs> doing fine in terms of their revenue. And I, I can't remember now, but I think Adam wrote about this, which yeah. was, uh, or maybe it was Randy, but the dichotomy where the New York Times will have to pull a letter if it was in print, mm -hmm. that's defamatory. But if the same letter is put on the New York Times Twitter account, it does not. Right. Which yeah. is strange. Yeah, it's very strange. And um, I also think it goes to our, our content moderation discussion um, because um, the platforms, I think, incongruously claim that they have protection under Section 230C1, which involves third party speech, when they're moderating section, um, when they're moderating content. So they claim that they have no immunity, they have complete immunity to you know, violate anti discrimination laws broad laws when they're moderating content because it's, it's third party speech. At the same time, on the other side of their mouth, they'll say, well, we have a First Amendment right to content moderate because it's our speech. So I think that's a, a inconsistency that the courts have allowed the um, platforms to, um, uh, to continue with, and I think it's something that will have to be examined more closely. Right, thank you. If I could just quickly respond to a somewhat different facet of the question. As I understood, the question is, under existing law, can, without any new statutes, can there be a claim brought uh, uh, that, that uh, 
a exclusion decision by Facebook or Twitter or Google uh, is, is illegal or unconstitutional? And I think the answer is no. I, I don't read Section 230C2 as broadly as Jane does. I used to, and then Adam persuaded me otherwise. Uh, so, the biggest, but... That was the biggest uh, success of my academic career, so... Uh, <laughs> but, but there's got to be a cause of action. Before we get to the question of whether it's preempted by 230, there's got to be a cause of action. Generally speaking, state public accommodation law does not uh, apply to, to platforms, and I think correctly. Uh, and uh, uh, the First Amendment doesn't apply to platforms because they are private actors. Uh, there could be good reason for Congress to try to treat them as public and publicly regulated, but under existing law they are private actors and I think quite correctly treated that way. There are a few possible asterisks in a few situations, but generally speaking it would require legislation whether federal or state uh, for, for any of these restrictions to operate, as it should be, I think. Let's go to the uh, next question in the front. Hi, good morning. My name is uh, Tyler Herman. Uh, I want to highlight a specific type of content moderation and see if it impacts your analysis at all or specifically the answer to the previous question, in fact. Over the last two years, a big focus of the mis- and disinformation has been election-related mis- and disinformation. And at the federal level, I believe, and certainly secretaries of state have created programs where they are monitoring posts to social media and they, the government entity, are going to Facebook or Twitter and saying, you should take a look at this post. This post is false, this post is problematic. And then it's the social media company that's removing it, but they're doing it at the direction of or after being highlighted by a government entity. Yeah. So that's the asterisk that I mentioned. There's an interesting question. What happens when private entities are, kind of get messages from the government saying take stuff down? I did some research recently, and here's the shape of the First Amendment law in the circuits on this. If the government says, you better take it down or else, that's government coercion, that's state action, and that is, in fact, state or federal, doesn't matter. Uh, that is, in fact, uh, a possible First Amendment violation. But the cases say, not they're pre-internet cases, but the very structurally analogous, if the government merely urges entities to take things down, writes a letter to some company saying, you know, you show some bookstore, you shouldn't carry this game that people find offensive for ideological reasons that we find offensive. That's just government speech and that's just kind of government, uh, government encouragement that they're entitled to engage in. Here's the curious thing. When it comes to the Fourth Amendment, the rule is somewhat different. At least a lot of lower courts say, if the government calls up me as a landlord and says, look, we can't search your tenant's apartment because we don't have probable cause and a warrant, but we know you can, and we know you have the right under your contract to go and kind of <coughs> inspect it for various things. Next time you're there, you want to check and see if there are any marijuana plants or something like that. Uh, then that is state action. So government persuasion and encouragement and requests in the Fourth Amendment are state action, in the First Amendment are not. And I don't know what the right answer is. But you're, you're asking that person to become a state actor for you. That's why. But, right. But the thing is, if the, if the government is calling me up and telling me to remove something from my site just because, I mean, the classic example is uh, the uh, police department calls up a newspaper and says, look, we know you're about to run this story. We can't stop you but it's gonna interfere with, uh, with a police investigation. Uh, and don't you want to catch criminals? Do you want, don't you want criminals to be caught? If you do, can you just accommodate us on this? I think that happens not infrequently. CIA sometimes does this with regard to national security things. And I think that's generally thought not to be enough to be state action. Maybe it should be, I don't know. Yeah, yeah. Well, Adam. well, first, I'm, we'll talk about the cases maybe, maybe afterwards. I think that there are, is some case law suggesting that a coordination of parallel action even in the First Amendment, can constitute state action. Um, but I, I, I want to get this back to common carriage and one of the benefits of, of, of a, a common carriage type regime. As the questioner correctly pointed out, one of the big problems of having large concentrated media entities is that they can collude and cooperate with government and take away our rights and do bad things to the democracy. Common carriage law is very, it, it, it has, has a nice uh, effect because it, it allows the media companies to say, look, I'm sorry, Mr. Government, I cannot bias my reporting or my um, 
algorithms um, to make you happy. It's against the law. And it places a, a, a nice um, uh, barrier between the government and um, media and First Amendment actors. Um, and you know, I think that's one, one of the reasons why we've had a free press um, and we have not worried about things like you know, constant telephone surveillance. Um, Let's go to the uh, microphone in the back first. Good morning, my name is Dwayne Horning. I'm from San Diego, California, the home of Pruneyard. And uh, Pruneyard is uh, notable because it requires shopping centers to function essentially as the public square, literally the public square, and it requires the, shop, the private owners of those shopping centers to accommodate public speakers as the government would in a public square. Pruneyard is limited to California. It was a California Supreme Court case. The US Supreme Court case affirmed it, but only for California. Now, I'm not a big fan of Pruneyard, but it does seem to me that it's a very easy step to go from physical shopping centers governed by Pruneyard to internet platforms, where shopping centers are physically the public square, and now the internet, essentially, and, and the, the, the companies we've been talking about, are the electronic version of that public square. It seems to me that that would be a, almost an automatic extension. Now, it is limited to California, but it just so happens, Facebook and Twitter and Alphabet and Amazon, all these companies are in California, and California has 11% of the population, and if 12% uh, of Facebook customers are in the US, I think probably the other 88% are in California. <laughs> so if Pruneyard was extended to apply to these companies only in California, the effect would be truly worldwide. Why wouldn't Pruneyard be an easy place for someone who wanted to regulate the, the, the internet actors as the public square uh, to be a basis to do so? Well, I'll just quickly, the sad reality is, I mean, from my perspective, that the state courts have been, uh, in California, have been um, not very pro Pruneyard. Um, and uh, they have not expanded, as far as I know, the doctrine in a lot of different places. But I'll, I'll leave it to James. I, I, I see a difference between uh, shopping centers, which provide a public accommodation for shopping, in which a non discrimination norm should be applicable under public accommodation law, and is applicable under public accommodation laws. You can't stop people. You, should, you cannot discriminate against people on the basis of race and religion and others from shopping at that shopping center. I don't see pu uh, public shopping centers as creating an expressive forum, a forum for expression. Um, and therefore, I don't see, I, I, I question whether a First Amendment type protection is applicable to a private um, arrangement, which is not about expression at all. What we're talking about today is um, the creation of expressive forums and whether a com public accommodation of an expressive forum, people can be excluded uh, because, of their, uh, because of their speech. And it, that, it would be the regulation of an expressive forum that would be bound by a First Amendment regime. Not, but I think shop, private shopping centers don't fit that description. Can I just follow up on that? Because actually under Pruneyard, that's exactly what's required. It has nothing to do with excluding people because of their color not to shop right. there. No, right. It requires people to, the shopping center owners, to allow I public know, expressive speech. But I'm dissenting from Pruneyard, is the, what I'm doing. The fact that it's a California case makes it all the worse. <laughs> The, the, the shopping center, though, in Prune Yard never actually argued. Th th this is why Randy's point about um, expressive forum is so important. They never argued that they were an expressive forum. They argued that as a private property owner, merely because of their property interests, uh, they should have a First Amendment right to exclude speakers because the speakers w are, uh, w it would be, you know, sort of compelled hosting of, of that speech. Uh, and and the, the case, I think, is limited to it's quite limited to its facts. So first of all, like I said earlier, um, the, the majority emphasized that these were orderly persons, so they weren't sort of getting in the way of the shopping mall's uh, attractiveness to, to its other customers. But, but more importantly, Powell's concurrence, if you read that, uh, I think it has a lot of fodder for explaining why uh, a, a, a social media platform could not be put in the same category as a shopping center. So first of all, 
Powell said that he's worried that, it, you know, if, if there's substantial annoyance to other customers for having to pass through or, you know, even be associated with, with, um, with the uh, un disfavored speech, then, then it would require these, like, really elaborate time, place, and manner restrictions. And he thought that, that Pruneyard should, should not impose, you know, th that even California state constitution could not impose that kind of um, Byzantine rule creation requirement on, on a private property owner. But he also said that, and this is, I think is important, that the strong emotions that would be evoked by speech by others who are seeing it in a public place might cause a shopping center like Prune Yard to have to <coughs> respond. Uh, and that, I think, is what's happening with Facebook and Twitter, that they, they you know, I, Facebook didn't, Facebook really didn't want to be in the content moderation business, but, uh, but the reaction to what is posted there publicly and publicly viewable is so repugnant to people that they, that Facebook, in order to keep, you know, credibility and, and hap the, hap you know, the happiness of their, um, of many of their users, had to respond. Um, and then finally, uh, Powell explained that in this case, there was no evidence about the sort of number and type of interest groups that are going to seek access to the center, and that this shopping center, Prune Yard, did not object to the ideas that were contained uh, in, in the particular uh, pamphleters. And so all of those are pretty, you know, pretty narrowly const uh, conscribed Prune Yard. Thank Gene, you, Jane. I'm wondering so what you think. I wanted to just <laughs> Jean, Jean, uh, can briefly... We, uh, can we go to sure. the, to the okay. next person? Okay, okay thank you. Because we have a lot of people still left. Let's go to the uh, front microphone. Thank you. Hi there, uh, Connor Miles, Center for the American Future. Uh, this question actually goes to Section 230's text, which probably should matter if regulations on the table. Uh, 230C1 says platforms should not be treated as providers of third-party content that they host, but C2 is the liability shield for platforms, and it seems to require platforms to only censor or edit in good faith a limited list of objectionable content, not just everything they don't like in order to fall under the shield. Uh, and circuit courts have interpreted uh, C2 broadly to shield a great deal of decisions by platforms or have kind of ignored it altogether in favor of uh, C1. What do you think SCOTUS will do when they reach C2 and how would you advise providers to read the entirety of Section 230 in the meantime? Anyway. So, so uh, 230C2, to be fair, uh, pro uh, provides that platforms uh, uh, are immune for good, in good faith, uh, restricting content that is lewd, filthy, harassing, violent, or otherwise objectionable. So, so it doesn't just have a list. It says or otherwise objectionable. And one controversy among lower courts, which are somewhat split on this, is whether that means anything the platforms in good faith simply means sincerely find objectionable. So for example, they find certain ideologies objectionable. Certainly people find ideologies objectionable. They can just block it because that's otherwise objectionable. Or whether you follow the interpretive canon of Eustem Generis, which says that a term such as otherwise objectionable should be read in light of the terms that precede it. And Adams in my article, uh, just, just out a few months ago in the Journal of Free Speech Law, um, uh, argues that in fact the Eustem Generis approach is the better approach. Uh, and the thing that the earlier things all have in common is these are terms that have historically been used to regulate uh, um, uh, material on telecommunications media. Harassing phone calls, violent television programming, lewd and et cetera, indecent material uh, on the internet. And in fact, every single one of those terms before the otherwise objectionable appears in one, in at least one other portion of the Communications Decency Act, the very act that included uh, Section 230. So that in context, it shouldn't authorize platforms to to uh, uh, remove material because it's objectionable based on its ideology, but only because it's objectionable based on criteria that historically have been used as a basis for telecommunications regulation. Whether the Supreme Court will buy that or not, I have no idea. But I, but I think Adam and I, I can confidently say, uh, think that's crossed. the better approach. <laughs> Once there's an underlying cause of action, there, that, that the plaintiff can bring. There, again, the main problem for most of these plaintiffs is not Section 230C2. The main problem is there's generally no underlying cause of action that restricts the platform's ability to, uh, to remove things, even in the absence of C2. Uh, 
Um, a question in the back, please. Thank you. Anthony Paracolo, student at Harvard Law. So one of the biggest issues I've noticed with tech is that they're supporting what I call demand side discrimination, which is effectively this woke fiction that the hamburger or the service that I'm using is more valuable based on the race of the owner of the, the business or the service. And so we've seen that by like Facebook and Google putting out free advertising uh, for businesses owned by like specific races. So I'm wondering, can there be and should there be uh, a class action lawsuit against these platforms for such content? And uh, if not, does this uh, weaken their Section 230 immunity? Who would like to address that? IDK. Yeah, it's an interesting question. It's kind of tangential, I think, to, to what we've yeah. been talking about, but it's an interesting question. It all depends on whether there's underlying cause of action. Um, let's go to the, to the front. Sure. Uh, Professor Barnett um, earlier referenced uh, sort of the, the idea that it would be acceptable to have, or at least philosophically, to have the same sort of rules apply public universities and private universities in the free speech context. So I, I think I've sued about 35 public universities. I've never sued a private school. Uh, I did send a nasty letter that was successful to Georgetown. Um, I'm sure it wasn't nasty enough. <laughs> right. um, but but, but I, I think the, the problem, the, the reason I've never sued them is because if, I, I think the, the problem is if you imagine, instead of Georgetown, imagine a religious college, um, like Catholic University. Um, <laughs> hey, look, you know, you're talking... You're talking so, nice so there's, Jewish there's, boy up here who teaches at Georgetown, so. So, I mean, there, there are schools like Catholic University and Liberty uh, for whom it, it feels different. And the reason I think that's relevant uh, in this context is all this conversation has basically been about, uh, you know, Facebook and Twitter and these major platforms, but things like GodTube also exist. Uh, websites that are, uh, that clearly do have their own values that they're bringing to the conversation. I'm wondering how the the public accommodations arguments, even the common carrier arguments, how would you limit an attempt to apply those kinds of policies to them without stepping into a situation where you really do have a, an obvious imposition on someone else's free exercise rights, free speech rights? Uh, how, do, how do you sort of cabinet so that it's just Mark Zuckerberg who's put out uh, and not GodTube and all the others? Well, in case I, I was misunderstood, I was not at all proposing that universities, private universities, should be considered c common carriers or public accommodation places of common. I was, not, I was not proposing that regime at all. All I was using it is an analogy between one regime in which the First Amendment is being applied legally and another regime next to it. Uh, in which it's not being applied legally, and it doesn't look that different, and it wouldn't be that onerous for that regime to be implied over here. It would look just like UCLA does. And so uh, right. that's, that's what's the only purpose of the analogy, not to suggest that Georgetown or any private university qualifies uh, in that middle category I'm talking about. So uh, just two data points that, that directly relate to, the, uh, uh, to, to this uh, Point, including religious universities, California has a uh, uh, state statute that bans private universities from imposing speech codes. Uh, and as best I can tell, the skies have not fallen. And it is a restriction <laughs> on private pr property and private entities, probably not very heavily enforced. It's there. Uh, there is an exception for religious universities, and likewise for private high schools, and an exception for religious high schools. So one possibility is to say, you know, it's not unconstitutional to impose such mandates, but maybe we do want to maintain a different space for religious entities. Um, uh, one other uh, example is Rumsfeld v. Fair. Rumsfeld v. Fair involved, and I think this is why it's such an important addition to Pruneyard, it involved entities that are all in the speech business, universities. Mm -hmm. It involved universities who, many of which were bitterly opposed to the speech they were required to host. They were uh, uh, required to host uh, military recruiters and they were opposed to military recruiting because of the time was discriminatory based on sexual orientation. They were getting huge pushback from their students, from many of their students, at least their activist uh, students, uh, uh, demanding 
demanding that they expel uh, the recruiters. Um, uh, they were finding themselves having to respond in some situations and say, well, uh, now that you're making us talk about this and making us host them, let's explain what our position is and such. And yet the court unanimously said that it's permissible to impose that burden. This having been said, Solomon, Solomon Amendment is another example. It actually had an exception for religious universities, although specifically <coughs> focused on religious pacifist universities that might object to military recruiters for because of the military rather than because of don't ask, don't tell. Um, so again, occasionally when Congress or legislatures, state legislatures enact this, they recognize that religious entities ought to be treated differently, ought to be given an extra uh, sphere of latitude. I'm not sure it's constitutionally compelled to do so though. Let's do the last two speakers, the last two um, audience members uh, in the back first. Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, Alden Abbott, uh, McLean, Virginia. Uh, last July, White House Press Secretary Jen Psaki stated regarding uh, the potential deplatforming of uh, certain stated views on COVID, quote, we're flagging problematic posts for Facebook that spread disinformation. We're working with, with doctors and medical experts who are popular with their audience with accurate information. So we're helping get trusted content out there. Does that involve sufficient government entanglement and coercion on a platform to, su to suggest state action? Who would like to address that? Well, I, I don't want to in any way you know, disagree with Eugene. It's not a good, it's not a good position to be in. Um, uh, but you know, I, I think the law is a little bit less clear um, that there is a, a room for sort of parallel action um, and collusion with a wink. Um, you know, when um, uh, you know, Henry II uh, a, you know, asked his barons, you know, will anyone rid of me of this troublesome priest? And they, you know, hypothetically, of course, and they marched down to Canterbury and, and uh, he killed Thomas a Becket. Was that state action? I would say yes. Um, under, <laughs> <laughs> under current precedent, I'm not so sure, but I, I, I think that courts could move in that direction, especially given we all know what's going on. Um, you know, is there, is there a clear threat? Is, is, is Jen Psaki saying, you know, I'm going to come over and, you know, beat Zuckerberg up if he doesn't do this? Well, maybe he is. I don't know. But um, uh, <laughs> the, I think um, she could take him. Yeah. <laughs> right. um, but um, the, the test may, not, uh, you know, the test may require a, a more clear um, quid pro quo. Jean, do you want to address it? No. no. Oh, Jean, no. I, okay. Yeah. I, Jane, I, you do. Surprising agreement with with Adam on this one. This is this is this is a, a surface where, um, you know, I I, I think we should we should be taking a hard look. Uh, and, uh, well, I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> All right, and then the last question from the audience. Uh, hi, I'm Diana Fritch, Scott Roth from George Washington University. I just have a quick follow-up on the question before about two th Section 230 and blocking content. Nowhere it says that set under Section 230 uh, that these companies are allowed to block speakers, only offensive content. Can you all comment on why these platforms were allowed to block President Trump? Thank you. Adam, you want to take it? Yeah, I, I mean, I just don't think the courts have been that sensitive to that textual difference. I mean, they've, they've largely elided speakers and content as, as, as I read the cases. Well, I think, I think that's part of it, but also there's no underlying cause of action that would keep Twitter from removing Trump's account. If there were a statute that said you can't discriminate against, against speakers based on the content of their speech or the content of their past speech or whatever else, then there'd be a question whether it's preempted by 230C2. But there are, I know of no public accommodation law, for example, that had been interpreted as applying to social media platforms, as opposed to, say, brick and mortar outfits and the like. 230C2, it's very important how it's going to be interpreted, but the very first question is, is there something that the defendants are doing that is said to be tortious or violation of some statute? And I just don't think that under current law, removing someone from a platform, stop saying you can't use our property anymore, is illegal. Maybe it should be. I just don't think it is. Right. And that's why Justice uh, Thomas's concurrence is so interesting to read, because he does go through the, the history of public accommodation and common carriers and, and 
maybe we should be thinking about this in a different way because these companies are very, very different from previous companies that we've had who uh, have all this access to information and they're the ones that wield the power in terms of that access. I wanna thank the panelists. Thank you. And thank you to the audience members.